see. I was born in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Uh -huh. oh, I was born in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, eleventh uh, month, the sixteenth day, eighteen ninety one. Uh, my mother and father were Ralph Daly, Senior, and Mrs. Lily Daly, my mother. I don't remember their ages. But I'm from, I think I'm the eighth of 12 children. 12? Mm -hmm. Six boys and six girls. Uh, yes, you know, you don't hear of families yeah. like that today. They just don't. Yeah. Uh, and all finished high school that didn't finish college. And uh, I guess about half of them finished high school and the rest finished college. There are six of us living now and uh, two brothers and three sisters. When did you uh, come out to the West Coast? I came to uh, Oakland September the 22nd, 1922. And I started a business. I couldn't find any way. So I started a business called Electric House Cleaning Company, which my wife named. And uh, I worked- Were you married when you came oh, out yes. here? Yes. Oh, you married uh, yeah, in, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I see. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's see now, what are I talking about? Oh, you uh, about uh, uh, Can you tell about my wife? Yes. Uh -huh. Is it going? Yeah, it's on there. Um, I met my wife in 19... 12 in Pensacola, Florida. And uh, I went to Pensacola, Florida after school had closed. And uh, I went into Sunday school that Sunday morning and I sat between two girls, there were three on the seat, and I sat between the two. A girl named uh, Lillian Hilton and uh, Miss Ridley. And uh, after Sunday school, we uh, walked out and then we went back to church together. And uh, we all sat together, the three girls and myself. And after school, why, uh, I uh, bid the girl goodbye, the three of them, and I went home with my brother and sister-in-law and their family. And uh, from that on, this girl and I were friends. And uh, we uh, belonged to the same church and the same Sunday school and was in the same class. And I stayed there about two years, uh, see. I stayed there about 15 months. And I remember uh, her, her cousin was a captain of a uh, Selma University baseball team and he played the same position as I did. And I was captain of mine at Talladega. And uh, I, we both played shortstop on each, on the team which we played on. And when I went to Pensacola, I met this young man there and we worked together. And um, when we called each other big boy, and uh, one Sunday we were, after church, we went and visited one another, and he was just talking, he said to me, oh, big boy, I says, I want to introduce you to my cousin. And uh, he said, oh, she has good eats. <laughs> and I said, what's the name? And he said, oh, Lillian Hilton. I said, oh, I know her. I said, yeah, I'd like to be acquainted to her. I met her, uh -huh. but I'd like to meet her like that again. And so mm -hmm. he said, I'll take you down there. I said, when? He said, Monday. So Monday came. Uh, he had to go to work nine miles from there, Fort Barrancas, they called it. And so I went by myself, and our appointment was for 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And I went down, and uh, we were, uh, and I met the lady, and we, uh, I even met her mother. and. Uh, 
from then on, we were friends. In fact, I didn't leave there until 9.30 that night. <laughs> and of course, we never, our friendship never broke. Well, that's, that's a wonderful story. And then you uh, you married in 1919. Yes, and I uh, and came out on, here. I went to Atlanta to school, and uh, see I uh, still in high school, so I had, I went back, and of course she was finishing that year. She had better opportunities than I did, because I didn't start school until well I was in the first grade when I was 11 years old. Oh, and. Uh, then when I finished, I went to Atlanta and left her in Florida, and uh, we corresponded. And uh, in World War One, I, I just finished high school, and uh, I went to war and I came back and we. Got you served in, in the Pittsburgh, World War One. Oh, That's how I lost my voice and hearing in World War One. Oh. When I left France. I couldn't speak above a whisper and close as you are to me now. I could barely hear you as loud as was you could Was that because hear. of the shells hearing oh, the explosion? Oh, from exposure and she's sleeping in mud and water. Ah, uh, and uh, more so tragic. And uh, then uh, when I came back, why, uh, we got married. Oh, after the war, right? After the war. Now, uh, tell me about your um, reason for coming to the Bay Area, to the West Coast? Oh, when I was a boy, when the earthquake, 1906, I was about 12 or 14 years old. And uh, I remember I was out on the street. We had a wood on the street, and we cut wood outside and brought it in. And so when the earthquake was, I'll never forget it, the uh, boy with the telegram says, great conflagration in California, San Francisco, California. And he went on to tell about what was being destroyed in the Great Fire. And I said, to myself, oh, I'm going to live in California. And uh, I don't know, it impressed um. me. And <clears throat> when I went to war and in France, the, um, then one day I saw hail, sleet, snow, rain, and sunshine, all within uh, four hours. And I said, uh, then, if I ever get out of this, I was going to California. So uh, I, uh, when I went back, I drank coffee the whole time I was in the city. And the day I got back, they gave us piping hot coffee and half milk and half coffee in the Hudson Terminal before going to Beatty's Cross by the Red Cross. And when I closed my canteen, well, I didn't open it for coffee anymore. And uh, that was the last time I drank coffee. Up to down, I, I have had you've no never, coffee. You've never had any I don't drink any coffee, no. Uh -huh. And uh, we went on to be discharged, and uh, I began my correspondence again. And uh, we, uh, and that was in March and June the 3rd, 1919, we got married in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And uh, my wife was teaching in Pensacola, Florida, and uh, she went back to teach. I, uh, when school closed, she, she came up there, and uh, we went back together, and we both went on the state teacher's examination. And uh, she made a second grade certificate and I like two points of making a second grade certificate, the first examination. Now, I was offered a principalship of a little school for $60 a month, but I didn't accept it. And uh, This was in Florida? Yes, in Florida. In Florida. Mm -hmm. I didn't accept it. <clears throat> so I went, uh, I was All-American star shortstop when I was at Talladega, and I uh, written up in all the papers in the country. and. Then when we went to Florida, I uh, took this examination, with, and they were off me I, a principalship, and I didn't take it. And then I got on a boat as a chef cook, and I worked there about a year. And 
I going think, out of Florida. Yeah, going out mm -hmm. of Florida. And uh, when that was over, uh, I went, I got off, and uh, then I went to my old hometown, Tuscaloosa, Alabama, where I was born, and they offered me a position of athletic director oh. and, uh, as a coach for baseball and football oh, yeah. at Tuscaloosa, Alabama, at Stillman Institute. And, but uh, the salary was only sixty dollars a month, and I couldn't see how I could make it on that. And then I uh, went to went back to Florida. And that's when I got on this steamer as a chef, and I made one hundred and twenty-five dollars a month. And then when that gave out, the ship was tied up. Why well, I came to California, September the twenty-seventh, nineteen twenty-two. Oh, I, I see. Now. Um, what started you on your uh, newspaper career? <clears throat> well, after we were here, uh, I didn't get anything to do in Mrs. Daly, and uh, I started the house cleaning company, which Mrs. Daly named as the Electric House Cleaning Company. And uh, she worked a while for Charlie Tillman, but Mrs. Daly had been a printer since 10 years old. And or she, did her people uh, yeah, were in the printing business? You know, uh, her brother-in-law had a print shop and a newspaper called the Sentinel in Pensacola, oh, Florida. Yeah. The Sentinel? And, and what was the other one? And called the Sentinel the in Sentinel. Pensacola, Florida. Yeah. I see. And from that on, she worked on when she finished, before she, well, she worked her way through school. Well, she went to school and uh, worked with Mr. Campbell, her brother-in-law. Uh, and uh, through the print shop. And of course, when he moved to Jacksonville, well, he moved the shop and that left her out and she just taught. And then when he came out here, uh, she uh, worked for Charlotte Tillman for uh, three or four months, well, maybe a year. And uh, then she was called to work with the California Voice, which had been going about five years. And uh, about, uh, who was the editor then of the uh, California Voice? Errol Marshall, E. Marshall. You should know him. Marshall. You know him. Yes. He lived Is, did, he, did he live in Berkeley? Yes. On, on uh, oh, um, Oregon. Yes, I think I know his. Uh, yeah. uh, Maggie Marshall was that his wife? No, no, no. She, they lived on uh, Harmon Street. Oh, I'm Maggie sure Marshall. I've heard of them. Yeah, I know. Mm -hmm. uh, her husband was a railroad man. Uh, e. Marshall was a uh, real estate broker. Oh. But this Mr. Marshall was the uh, head of the he voice. He was the organizer of the voice. Oh, he and, started it. Yeah, he started in 1919. And, uh, and, uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Coleman, you remember him? Yeah. He uh, started what was called the Oakland Sunshine, and uh, between the two of them, one of these all the squad, one of them come out this week with an article against the other one, and the next week the other one come um, out, and so they, they squabbled among themselves. So they finally got together, and Mr. Marshall brought Dr. Coleman out, and uh, um, from that on it was just the California Voice. I see. Uh, and uh, Mrs. Daly started working for him in 1923 in August. She started first? Mm -hmm. I see. And I was still with my house cleaning. And uh, I kept the house cleaning company going. In 1923, she started working with Mr. Marshall. And, uh, 19 and she worked for him until 1927. He left, he left town, 26, he left town and uh, with a young lady, I won't name her, you might know her. And, uh, and uh, that year, his partner, Mr. Henderson, lost $3,500 and he decided to sell it. And uh, they were about to sell it, and we heard about it, and so we went to Mr. Henderson, his partner, and asked him what did he want for it, and he told us. And so 
And he said, well, if you want to sell it, I'd like to buy it. And he said, I'd like to sell it to you. So we came into an agreement, and uh, we bought it. <coughs> and what meantime, pardon me, cut it off. <coughs> <coughs> September 67, uh, September 27, I started to finish my college work. And so my credits didn't come in time. And therefore, I went to Sacramento Junior College. I didn't. I wanted to be a regular student. I didn't want to be a special. And so, uh, went up there and spent a semester at San Francisco. I mean, at Sacramento Junior uh -huh. College. Mm -hmm. And uh, then, uh, I went there at Sacramento Junior College, and uh, we rented a building out at Sacramento Junior College and about 12 of us boys, 12 boys, and I was the only adult there. <coughs> oh. And among those were John Bolin, uh, Byron Rumford, W.D. Wilson, and I can't think of the other fellow's name. Oh, and uh, Barranco brother, one of the Barranco oh, boys. Oh, uh, Lester up or there. Arnold? No, Lester. Lester. Yeah. Uh -huh. And we stayed up there. And uh, I stayed up there that semester. And when the semester ended, we went home for the holidays. And we went back. And uh, Ms. Daly was negotiating uh, with my consent to purchase a voice. And uh, we. Uh, Decided to take over. She called me up one night and said, "Oh, Dave says come in. Well, how would you like to come home?" I said, "What for?" And she explained it to me. And uh, I said, "Well, I come in and I have to wait until tomorrow, and I go to the office and get indefinite leave of absence. Then I'll come home." So the next day I went to the office, dean of men, and I got an indefinite leave of absence, I came home, and from that on, I was uh, working with the boys. Oh. What, do, do, can you remember anything about the first, um, the first <laughs> things you did on the paper? Uh, oh, I, only thing, the first thing I did, I think, was to help pick up some the chases that the paper were made in, and, uh, and move them, and I took them to where they were printed, and, brought them back. Uh, Mrs. Daly set the type and mm -hmm. uh, and I just, because I knew nothing of printing. And uh, after that, I went to linotype school and learned linotype. But oh. I didn't like linotype. So then I studied real estate and I went into real estate and the money came from real estate well, I put it into the boys to carry Oh, on. I see. You had a business on the yeah, side with, yeah. uh, with real estate. Mm -hmm. And uh, we kept our office there for a few months, and then they moved at 26, 24 San Pablo. And uh, we stayed there from 23 until 40, 48. And 48, I built my own little building in uh, a lot and I bought where was that on San Pablo oh uh, and I bought uh, this building which was in the ground was 50 by 100 and uh, there was a driveway 26 feet so I uh, took this driveway and uh, built it as close to the house as I could 26 by 75 and that was our office until 19 and 59. Uh, uh, we safely bought us out. In uh, 1942, I bought two places on uh, 27th Street, uh, 814 and 818. And uh, I, I sold, uh, I hate to sell. 818 in order to hold 814. And mm -hmm. so <clears throat> when I s sold this place, why well, we got cash from Safeway and uh, I had paid for the place 814. So 
I told down 814 and uh, rebuilt it uh, as a building for the, and a home for the boy, which it now stands. Oh, I see. Did you, do you have any children? No, we never had any, any children. children. No. no, my wife had something that she couldn't bear children. She had what's called a natural regression. We didn't know it until it was too late. Oh, I, I was just thinking of children them. in your, uh, following um, in your footsteps. No, my, my mother told my wife she wouldn't have any. Oh. And she oh. named three, two boys and a girl. And uh, my wife told her, you won't have any of your two wives, so you name them before they come. Oh, so, <laughs> so they did, never, didn't you never had the children no. for the name? No. Oh, that got his name, I've forgotten. <laughs> Can you um, can you think of some of the old famous Negroes that made history, you know, in headlines uh, during your time? Dr. Coleman, uh, Reverend Byers, uh, Reverend Wilding, or uh, Reverend Hawkins. Uh, I see Reverend Hubbard. C.L. Delms. S.J. Duncan. Uh, let's see who else. Oh, and Seal, Sylvester Seal. Sims. Sims, yes. Yes, uh -huh. he was here with the restaurant. I found him here running a restaurant called the Overland Cafe. That was down in West Oakland. That's right. right. Miss mm -hmm. Sims still lives, you know. And uh, I was trying to think of who else. Did uh, Du Bois ever come to du town Bois. while you Du Bois when you were uh, had the, during the time you had the paper? Did he ever visit here? I was just wondering. I don't remember Du Bois. I remember him uh, when I was much younger. My sister speaking about it. She finished graduated from Tuskegee. Oh, but yeah. she is deceased uh -huh. now. I don't ever remember. What about Paul sister. Robinson? Did he ever come here? I think he day? did. I think he came here once. I'm not I sure see. now. But I think he did. He did come here once. And Roland Hayes came several times. Oh, yes. Did you interview yeah. him or uh, no, write I about didn't. him? No, I sister? didn't. Uh, a Philip Randolph. Oh yes. Was here several times. We were personal friends. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I knew Walter White, the first uh, sec national secretary of the NAACP. I've been a member of the NAACP since 1920. Oh, that's good. I joined them in Pensacola, Florida, uh -huh. in 1920. You've been in a long time. Mm -hmm. I j also joined the Knights of Pythia that year. Oh, that's your, mm -hmm. uh, your lodge. Yeah. That's where I was living at that time. And uh, I've been uh, everything but the Grand Chancellor of the Knights of Pythia. I was a Grand Deputy for five years. Oh, that's interesting. I was also a Deputy Grand Master of the Art Fellows yeah. for five years. So you belong to the Pythians and the NAACP. Are there any other civic uh, groups? I'm the uh, Knights of Pythia, the Codical Land, and the higher branch of the Pythian. I belong to uh, three orders of the Mason, and uh, I belong to the Shrine, and I was, I have been given for honorary services, uh, past potentate degree of the shrine, and I was, and I was offered this year uh, the um, 33rd degree, but I refused to take it. Why? Why did you? <laughs> Cut it over, oh. did you? Offered me the 33rd degree of, of the Mason. But I refused because when I 
went into the shrine, they told me that I couldn't go any further unless I, or until I had done something uh, complimentary or uh, was favorable for the community. And so I never considered I had done that. In 1948, they offered it to me for a price, and I turned it down. And uh, for the last 20 years, I've been chairman of the Shrine Christmas Party. And I have donated to them uh, a thousand stockings for that Christmas party oh, each my. year. I've done that for 20 some years. Where is this Christmas party? It's given at uh, Masonic um, McClellan High School Chapel oh. Auditorium. <coughs> and uh, <coughs> so uh, my, I, my wife wanted to pay me to go in there. I said, no. They told me when I got the 32nd degree, I couldn't get the other degree until I had done something meritorious, and I don't think I have, so I don't want it. And I said, furthermore, they told me that I'd have to, I couldn't pay for it, so I don't want it. And so, uh, last no, of year, not. They have to pay yeah, for and it? last year they came to me for it, want to give it to me. And uh, they signed my lodge, want to give it to me uh, for meritorious service. And I saved them over $3,500 this 20 years, besides what I had given them. Uh, and uh, so when they gave it to me, when the papers came back, it was from Los, Los Angeles. They wanted a big amount of money. And I told them not to keep it. I didn't want to buy honors. I, I've been in the presence of governors, presidents, senators, vice presidents, and, and uh, senators and assemblymen and congressmen. And uh, I've never gone to any place looking to pay for any honors. And if I got to pay for any more honors, I don't want them. I don't want to buy honors. That was good. And I, I refused it. No, it, 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 you, you pay for an honor, it, you, it isn't an honor. No, it isn't <laughs> you know? an honor. No. So I refused. I wouldn't take it. I don't blame you. I I say this. I was saying. Um, Did you want to say something on this? Yes, you have a paper here, Mr. <coughs> Mr. Dale. His report on the candidates, Alameda County, given by the Alameda County Negro Republican <coughs> League, congressional and presidential. You this know, is very interesting. Tell me something no, about I, this. I organized that. I, I think it was that year or the year before, and uh, there was a Mr. Mac Leslie McFarland who's now deceased, uh, helped me to organize it. And uh, the can this in 1934, the Congressman Tolan was uh, he was Congressman and he was running for re-election, and Assemblyman Fisher who later be, was appointed judge of Alameda County uh, uh, Judicial, and then later Superior Court Judge. Mm -hmm. But uh, in 1928, Mr. Fisher took a Negro to court who lived up on uh, Mandana Boulevard in a, hou in, a, in a house on a hill about 45 degrees. And they condemned this piece of property to make a street out of. And in order to get this black man or Negro out of this district. And uh, they did it, but they never did put the street through. Just to get him out. <laughs> yes. Uh -huh. Then uh, in 19, and t uh, later, I think it was 1930, Mr. Fisher wrote some letters to his constituents, all white, in the district, and uh, telling them that the only benefit that he got out of it was to keep an undesirable out of the district. He got no compensation for the work whatsoever. Uh -huh. <clears throat> and uh, this friend of mine got this from me, and he gave it to me, and uh, I read it. And then I went to Congressman Tolan, and uh, told him of the situation. And Mr. Tolan was very straight condition then because he was being fought very hard and he was under the impression he was going to be defeated. 
So uh, I went to him and asked him to give me money to print uh, 10,000 of these circulars. And he did. And uh, when they were printed, and I got, when he gave me the work, well, I put what Congressman Tolan had done on one half of the, the page, and the other half was what Assemblyman Fisher had done in the assembly when he was in the assembly. Oh, and yeah. um, then uh, I went and asked him to give us money to print 10,000, which he did. And I printed those in my own shop on my own machine. I have I noticed a letter here from uh, Walter White on this sheet. Yes. And in it he uh, speaks of... Um, uh, the anti-lynching bill. Yeah. And at that time, uh, um, did your paper uh, talk about this very much? This oh, yes. The voice has always been considered the mouthpiece of the NACP on the Pacific Coast. I see. We've always supported the work of the NACP. Yet, I... I I didn't always agree with the things that the NACP did, but I supported them because they I knew support. their motives were right. I, I accept them yes. as fact, and of course, I believed in it, and of course, I supported them. Yeah, this paper is uh, certainly an interesting <coughs> thing. I notice here, uh, Negroes are represented in the following departments of the state. State Fire Marshal's Office, State Vehicle Department, State Oil Department, State Highway Department, State Boys Industrial School, State Reformatory, State Girls Home at Beloit, State Prison, and the State Personnel Messenger. Now, when this came out, that uh, we printed, and they, they on a Thursday, on a Friday, and Saturday morning, we took this paper down. So, uh, we sent it down to the Republican headquarters, and Mrs. Brinkinbridge Thomas, she was a big Republican in the county at that time. She lived in Berkeley. Yeah. She still lives, and uh, she said this defeated us, and uh, we got these ten thousand circulars, and everybody in the district took that. She said this, this paper. Yeah, we had ten thousand of these, and we distributed them through. Uh, 83 precincts, and out of the 83 precincts, Mr. Fisher won one, and that was number one, which was Extreme West Open. At that time, the numbers started in number one, and, and they got larger as they went south. Oh. And now, after then, uh, I think about 1940, they changed it and put the smaller number down south and then the larger ones out here in the west. Oh, I see. I know you've uh, you've been in the Republican Party a long yeah, time. Yeah, I'm still you? a Republican. I'm a okay. Republican, but I go for the man, not the party. I've yes. always yeah. done that. I, uh, being a Republican, when <clears throat> Brian Rumford was uh, elected against John Henderson to go to Sacramento, <clears throat> well, we had an elimination party at Hoover High School. And like tomorrow night, which would be Monday night, Brian Rumford would come, and uh, Johnny Henderson would have come up for election to see who we would send to Sacramento. And uh, that day before, which was Sunday, Mrs. Daly remained home and used the telephone at home, and I went to, uh, to the office and use the telephone there and we called up all our friends to support Brian Rumford. And um, Brian Rumford, uh, he won over Johnny Henderson. This was for the assembly? Yes. When did, when was that? What, do you remember what year? Oh, about 1948, I think, somewhere in there. Yeah, about that time. I remember, but I just couldn't remember the exact date. Yeah. And uh, we support, now I'm a Republican, but I supported Brian Rumford. And I've always supported Brian Rumford and all of his works in the assembly because I believed he was always You believed right. in the man, like yeah. you say. And uh, therefore, when uh, 
and I supported governors up to Governor Brown, all Republican, but I supported Governor Brown. And uh, I'm the man that told Governor Brown that he could get a third term. He could get what? A third term as governor. Oh. But uh -huh. he, he failed, which two hours sorry. Yes, he, I hate to say that. He, uh, Governor Brown, was the best governor we ever had in California for all the people, regardless of race or creed or color. Did you know him personally? Did I know him? I'm sure. I used to go up there. If, if they had listened at me, George Vaughn today would have been a judge. Um. I w went to, uh, yeah, when, when Norman Brown, the Governor Knight was in there. Uh, I went to Governor Knight and asked him, I said, Governor, uh, I would like for you to appoint a Negro as judge in some of the courts in Northern California. And uh, he, that was on a Tuesday, uh, on, a, yeah, on a Tuesday. And uh, Wednesday night, the next night, I, I went to Columbus, Ohio, to the press meeting in NP Press meeting. And uh, while there, I talked with Mr. Beavers, um, either Mr. Beavers or Mr. What's the doctor? Dr. Goodlett. Oh, Goodlett, yeah. <laughs> and uh, we, he asked me about it, and I said, oh, yes, I'm glad you spoke about it. I said, I just talked with the governor yesterday. And he told me just what to do, and he said, I'll tell you. I said, now you go, and I, because I won't be home in two weeks. I'm going from here to uh, New Jersey and New York. I'm going to visit my people. And I said, I, I won't be back for two weeks. And you get from me four people with yourself. And when I come, it'll be five. And we want to all decide on who you met. Everybody said it must be unanimous. And then when that comes, then we call in the governor. And when I got back, they had called a meeting, and they had uh, two Vonges, and uh, Mr. Fouché, Dr. Goodlitz, and one or two more. And uh, when I came, they had uh, done this, and they had the meeting, they called the governor in. Oh. And, and so uh, when I came, oh, oh when uh, they called the governor in, they had the meeting, I was there waiting for the governor came in, and he, they greeted him, and he said, oh, where's Mr. Daly? And Vivian. Vivian Marsh. Vivian Marsh. Yeah. Nobody said a word, so he got up and left. So when I um, came in, one of the party told me about it. So I got in touch with Governor Knight, and I told him, I said, Governor, all I want you to do is to appoint a governor, a black, a black judge in the North. And I said, Just whoever you appoint is all right with me. I said, other than that, I wiped my hands off of it. And uh, so a daily you pointed at him about two, three weeks after that. I talked with him, and he said, well, I'm pointing Mr. Bussey. I said, oh, you oh. couldn't appoint a better man. I said, he's the best man you could have appointed. And uh, he said, well, that's who I'm pointing. I said, fine for me. And uh, we talked. and. That's how his appointment came That's about. That's how his appointment came. And yet I never told anybody. <clears throat> but uh, I told two or three people about why these people didn't, why Vaughn wasn't appointed. Now I had agreed. Uh, he asked me, he said, who do you have as your preference? I said, I don't have any preference. He says, how about George Vaughn? I said, it's all right for me. I said, I don't yeah, You weren't naming George. anyone. No, I didn't have any favorite. But uh, I said, I'd go along with George, and uh, expecting them to do that. And when I got there, they had disappointment. So rather than have a feud over it, well, 
I just wiped my hands off of it and told the governor about it, see? and then he did it. Well, that, I, I, I never did meet uh, Governor Knight or Karen Bussey, Judge Bussey. Well, I knew, I met Bussey when I first came here. He was friendly towards uh, my niece in Los Angeles. They knew one another and they were friendly. They used to visit one another, see. Oh, I see. He he passed away, didn't he? Yes, he a passed couple of years ago. Five yeah. years ago. Yeah. I heard a lot about him through the he, years. You know, heard that name. He uh, passed more people to the bar association than any one man in California. Not only colored, he he passed all the whites, and all of them went to school under him to learn how to pass the ball or to yeah to pass um. the ball. He had a, a a law school just to pass lawyers. Oh, a school for lawyers. That's no, all he that did. That is tremendous. That's what he did until he it's was appointed. Oh, that must have been marvelous. Yes, sir. Uh, and they all knew him. Where was that in San Francisco? San Francisco, San Francisco yes. Did uh, did anyone keep it going? Uh, no, I not that I know. Of. I don't know anybody who's kept it going. But he did it. Uh, just the thing because they work so hard in that exam. They say it's yeah. one of the hardest to run. Yeah, it's hard. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I didn't care whether you're white or black. If you came out of the state, you weren't a citizen of California. It was almost impossible for you to pass the examination unless you studied in this state. And he had these special classes. That's right. Yeah, that's really something. That's right. What was the circulation of the voice? Uh, well, we'll say it is highest. Well, it's highest. Yeah, I'll say it. At no. one time, it was sixteen thousand five hundred. Uh, when I took it over, we had about uh, five hundred when we took it over. Oh my, that was quite an increase. Yes. that was a big increase. <laughs> and what did it sell for? What was the price? Uh, well. The Voice proper sold for fifty-two thousand dollars. That's the paper and the machinery. Oh no, I didn't mean uh, the, the I didn't mean the transaction. Oh. I meant the paper itself. Oh the well, paper the itself. paper went along with the um, machinery and the, you mean what I saw. No, no, I meant uh, when, when you I bought uh, it the, from the stands. This when you buy the paper. Oh, on the five cents. Five cents when you said Yeah, stand. yeah, I misunderstood. Yeah, oh. it went along with five cents. And then what did it go up to? And I know it. Uh, well, it it went up to uh went up to ten cents. And I, I think that's it never all. sold for more than ten? Oh, that was no, we I think we kept it down to ten cents until we sold it. And we they kept the uh then the subscription was two and a half a year. Oh, and then we went up to uh, five dollars a year. We never went higher than that. And I think uh, last year I think we went up to six dollars. Now it's seven and a half. Who did you have many people um, working for you? More than many employees? No. <coughs> We never had a lot of people waiting for it because uh, we couldn't afford it. Oh, sure. Mm -hmm. We had to economize on everything we possibly could. Yes. Even help. Mm -hmm. Now, I never had an uh, advertising agency on salary because we tried them during the Depression. And that must have been a trying period. It was. We used to give them a dollar a day. And uh, that's all they would get. They wouldn't try to do it. Go out and take that for a dollar a day and eat and do whatever they could with it. They didn't worry about it. And so I learned by that. And I had the uh, white and colored advertising agencies, and all of them do the same thing. That's yeah. That uh, that advertising though is what uh, what makes the paper. I guess. Yeah, that's what it's makes carries the paper. On. Without advertising, you can't go. No, no, you have no. to have that. Now, there are different kinds of advertising, which I never could get into. They are advertising, you know, just like articles, you know. But I never, not being 
a trained newspaper man. Well, I didn't know the out and in of the waking up. Of people. course, there'd be so many tricks to yeah. that trade. And so, uh, how did you get your material? Oh, we had uh, NNP and uh, news. We had some advertising came from our national advertising agency in New York, and then Chicago. Chicago office is no more, and uh, we got advertising here. I got what I could here. 